Excuse me, I, there is no sound. It seems that there is no sound. Can somebody fix it, please, for the remote connection? Um, and this talk is going to be about uh, large logs that are not. I'm very sorry. Okay, now it works. Yeah, so I will talk about a strange type of logarithm, the so called superleading logs, and a clever way to deal with them in higher orders. Now, consider a typical jet cross section at any particle collider could be E plus E minus or proton proton. We have two jets. Um, here I'm looking at not particularly small jets. Um, in between the jets, there is some rapidity interval with veto hard radiation. We just say that all radiation between the jets should be soft. Uh, that's called a gap between jets observable or also interjet energy flow. Um, now, this is an example of a cross section that has this uh, unusual kind of logarithms. The logs of the type alpha s to the n log to the m. Um, where the large log here is the ratio of the energy of the incoming patterns, so that's the platonic center of mass energy divided by this veto scale q naught. Now, in the plus and minus collisions, these logs are um, single logarithmic, so for each power of alpha, we get at most one log, and they're called non global logs. I will come back to them later. For Hadron Collider, something very strange happens. At one, two, and three loop order, it looks exactly like a d plus e minus. And starting at four loop order, one gets two powers of logs for each order. I should say this is actually a conjecture. We will prove this in our paper, but this is only known at this order. So these are the super leading logs, super leading because they're one order higher than one would naively expect. And these super leading logs are sub leading in color and they're not contained in any existing pattern shower. So they are completely missed in all calculations of LHC cross sections. Now, before I go on, where do these logs come from? The logs in collider physics always come from incomplete cancellations of infrared um, divergences, soft and collinear. So typically, for instance, we can have a virtual correction, a virtual diagram, which has soft and collinear divergences. And uh, these cancel, of course, against real emissions, as you know. So here's a real emission inside the jet cone. Here's a real emission outside the jet cone. But now there's the point. So if the emission is inside the jet, we don't veto its energy. If it's outside, we veto its energy and we cut the phase space. And this is the source of the log. So all the poles cancel, the one over epsilon poles. So there are no divergences left, of course, but there are large logs left, um, which involve the ratio of Q over Q. So if you have never worked on collider physics, this is how the large logs come in. Now, since these superleading logs, they happen first at four loop order, there's very little known about them. Um, they were discovered in these gaps between jets observable that are discussed in quark quark scattering 2006. And they were discovered with a question mark in the title. So it was argued that there might be these effects. There was no calculation, of course, really at four loop order demonstrating their existence. Now, later, two years later, the leading superleading log, so at four loop, was calculated for arbitrary two to two hard processes. And um, for a very selected set of two pattern channels, also the next superleading log, alpha to the fifth, log to the seven, was computed, and that's it. No more is known. The all order structure of these terms, how they contribute to other processes, two to n, let's say, and also the asymptotic behavior, like uh, in the Sudakov case, we have double logarithmic corrections, but we know that when we resum them, we get something that is extremely well behaved because essentially they go in the exponent with a minus sign. So for large Q, they, they drop off very quickly. Here, the asymptotic behavior was completely unknown. Um, so what I just want to get across is these superleading logs are the parametrically leading contributions to 
exclusive LHC cross sections, and we don't know how to control them in higher orders, and they're not included in pattern showers. I will argue in this talk that these effects can actually be as large as a one loop correction numerically, and I will show you how to deal with them in higher orders. Now, how do we deal with uh, large logs? Of course, ideally, we resum them. And that's possible in very simple processes. So for instance, if you look at something inclusive, such as event shapes, event shapes near the two jet limit, uh, we have factorization theorems where we write the cross section in terms of jet functions, hard functions, and soft functions. The soft functions are extremely simple because soft radiation does not resolve really the details of this process. It just sees these two highly energetic quarks flying apart and uh, one gets a soft Wilson line in the direction of those two patterns and squares that and that's the soft function. And because this is so simple, we know how to resum the large logs in such processes to very high accuracy. Now, if we go to non-global observables, such as exclusive jets, where we have a jet um, and now a veto outside the jet. So now what happens is that um, we can have gluon soft gluon emission from the uh, from the uh, parent pattern here but we can also have soft gluon emission from any of the branchings of that parent pattern which we don't see because they happen inside the jet okay and this is where the super leading logs where the, the non-global logs come in when these emissions can happen from secondary patterns and that generates uh, alpha log to the n at the plus the minus colliders, as I showed before. And that was discovered in 2002 by Das Gupta and Salam. Now, in the large NC limit, one can work with these superleading logs by solving a nonlinear integral equation due to Banfi, Marcusini, Smai. This is very different from RT equations. This is an integral equation and it's nonlinear, something very complicated. And it's very hard to work beyond the 1 over NC the end to infinity limit, but it has been done in the first order. There's no generalization of this to hadron colliders, so this only works in E plus E minus. Now, a couple of years ago, with Thomas Becher and uh, Ying Yu Shao and Lorena Roten, we have used soft collinear effective theory to derive a factorization theorem for non global observables, first at E plus E minus, of course. At the plus and minus, we could show that uh, it looks almost like in the first case, it's a product of a hard function with a soft function. Um, the hard function is the square of the hard scattering amplitude. The soft function is some Wilson line matrix elements. It looks like in the case of thrust, the difference here is that sum over the pattern multiplicities, because actually we need to sum over an infinite number of hard functions multiplied with an infinite number of soft functions. And that's the difference. Nevertheless, this factorization theorem separates the two scales. The hard function depends on Q, the soft function at Q naught. Um, these two objects are properly defined. Just show you this so you know that that is true. We can write down quantum field theory formulas for them. Um, and since it's a factorization theorem, uh, it provides a very natural way to do the resumation by RG methods. And what we showed is that we can solve these RG equations and we reproduce all these non global logs, even though in the traditional way they follow from some critical equation. Um, this formula is not limited to leading logarithms and it's also not limited to the large NC approximation. So it's much more general. And the sum of our pattern multiplicities here really accounts for these branchings. You see, I can start with a jet uh, that starts out from one quark, but the quark can emit two gluons, and then I really have three hard patterns in this jet, and the soft gluons can couple to all of them. Um, so this is why there is this sum here, because this can happen infinitely many times, and each time you do a branching, you get a log. So it's not so fast. Now, for hydrogen colliders, a similar formula holds. Um, what was soft here, I call W now because it's not entirely soft. And also, of course, the hard functions are different now because now I have two colored particles in the initial state in addition to colored particles in the final state, of course. So this is now a two to M process here. Um, and the low energy matrix elements are still soft weights and lines, but in addition now we have for the initial state patterns, two collinear fields in the effective theory. 
that's a relatively simple uh, generalization. Now, nevertheless, the uh, effective theory in which these quantities are defined is a more complicated version of soft collinear effective theory. Now, it's one where one has Glauber gluons. Glauber gluons lead to non trivial interactions between soft and collinear particles, and this is a source of factorization breaking. Actually, the superleading logs are an example of factorization violation at the LHC. This is well known. Now, what are these RG equations? So, for instance, the uh, RG equation for the heart functions is shown here. It looks like you would normally think this is an anomalous dimension which multiplies the heart function, but the key here is that heart functions of lower multiplicity mix into heart functions of higher multiplicity. And that's simply this picture that when I do a scale transformation, I can emit an extra pattern and a, let's say a two leg function mixes into a three leg function, etc. The strategy for resumming these normal overlocks at heart colliders is compute these heart functions at the heart scale of order Q, the center of mass energy, evolve them down to a low scale of order Q naught, solving this equation, and then compute the low energy matrix elements at that low scale. And here, of course, we are at the LHC, so there will also be part on distribution functions which we have to evolve to the same scale. And that's just the club evolution. Thank you. So let me do this. At least formally, I can do that. Simply uh, exponentiate the anomalous dimension to get the evolution function. So I take, instead of looking at this quantity, I take the hard function down at the hard scale, the matrix elements at the soft scale, and then have an evolution function that brings me from the hard scale to the soft scale. And that's nothing but the path ordered exponential of the anomalous dimension. So far, so good. You have all seen formulas such as this one, uh, but as you will see, this anomalous dimension is extremely non-trivial. First of all, it is an operator in color space, so it actually changes the colors of the patterns involved. It's also an operator in the infinite space of pattern multiplicities. So this is really an infinite dimensional square matrix. Um, so that's why I say formal solution. But this is the exact solution to this problem. If you would work this out, you would find all logarithmically enhanced corrections to LHC cross-sections. So this is a completely general description of non-global observables. And for the remainder of the talk, I will look at the leading logarithms, the leading terms in this formula. And from those terms, we have obtained an all-order understanding of the non-global logs, which was completely missing until now, right? We only had the for-loop contribution. We'll be able to do this to all orders. So to this end, one really needs to do the simplest thing, which is basically lowest order matching one loop anomalous dimension, as we always do in leading log approximation. Lowest order matching, I only need to take the four particle heart function because the five particle heart function will have an extra alpha, the six particle heart function will have extra two alphas. So at lowest order in alpha, it's only H4 that is non-zero. For the soft matrix elements, it's even more trivial. There are Wilson line operators. In three level, the Wilson lines are simply equal to one. So the matrix elements are one times um, pattern distribution functions for the two incoming patterns. In the one loop anomalous dimension, I only give you the soft part here. There is a collinear piece, which is basically D club evolution. The soft anomalous dimension has this interesting structure. At one loop, it has terms on the diagonal which are basically virtual terms, virtual correction terms. They take an amplitude, basically exchange a pattern here, but keep the multiplicity intact. But they are also on the off diagonal real emission terms, where, which generate an extra pattern. And that's why it's off diagonal, right? You can start with a, a four pattern function, you apply this anomalous dimension, uh, you do a real emission, you get a five pattern function. You apply the anomalous dimension again, you get a six pattern function, and so on. And that's what generates the non global logs. Um, so, in this approximation, we, we, we get this for the super leading log contribution to a cross section, the born cross section times heart function H4, the evolution function, and one for the matrix element. And the evolution function, of course, the path ordered exponential is defined by its Taylor series, where the ordering 
shows up in the limits of these integrals. Now, for quark-initiated processes, we have succeeded to extract the superleading logs in this infinite series. Blue ones are more complicated. We haven't published anything. It's work in progress, but we're pretty confident that the same can be done also there, which has been more complicated. Now, I don't have the time here to give you all the technical details of this calculation, but I want that you understand the key fact why Hadron colliders are different from E plus and minus colliders in this context. And that has to do with so called Coulomb phases. In fact, these superleading logs have a very subtle effect, and they have to do with these Coulomb phases. If it wasn't for these phases, there would not be these double logarithmic corrections. Um, and this is the famous anomalous soft anomalous dimension that arises when you exchange a soft gluon between two highly energetic partons. Um, for each pair of partons, ij, you get a logarithmic contribution times the cusp anomalous dimension times the product of color generators of parton i and parton j. This is the color space notation. And the argument of the log is mu square over minus sij, where sij is the is the invariant mass, 2 pi i pj, but there is a sign factor here. If both particles are either in the final state or in the initial state, then S is positive, time-like, and because of this minus sign, there is an imaginary part of this quantity. If one pattern is in the initial state, the other is in the final state, then it's a space-like kinematics, and then S is negative, and combined with this sign, there is no imaginary part. Okay. Here you see the difference. At the plus and minus, all particles are in the final state. So each of these logs is time-like. Each of them has an i pi. Um, but then color conservation allows you to simplify this expression, and the i pi you will find is proportional to the unit matrix in color space. And then when you square the amplitude. The complex conjugate amplitude has the minus i pi and the effect cancels. So there's no non trivial Coulomb phases at the plus and minus colliders. At proton colliders, we have two patterns in the initial state. So there are some pairs, ij, where we are in this space like kinematics. And, that's the, and then this cancellation doesn't work anymore. And if you do the algebra carefully, you find that the imaginary part of this anomalous dimension. Even though this can be an arbitrary number of patterns, you can always use color conservation to write it in terms of the generators of the initial state patterns, because if they wouldn't be there, the effect wouldn't be there. So one gets a non-trivial imaginary part, which has the product TITJ, color generators of the initial state particles, and then some stuff that again is proportional to the unit matrix and it's irrelevant. And it's this non-trivial imaginary part that leads to the superleading logs. Basically, in this expression that I showed you, which had real emission terms and uh, virtual corrections, we need to clean it up a little bit. This expression turns out to have still collinear singularities, which need to be regularized and split off. The collinear singularities give rise to these mu dependent terms in the anomalous dimension. Um, and then there is the regularized uh, terms, which are free of collinear singularities. And then there is this Glauber piece in the virtual corrections, which is essentially the effect that just calculated the 8i pi t1 times t2 and the notation, don't worry about it, I have no time to explain it. So basically, the superleading logs, as you can guess, arise from this piece here. And when we further expand the evolution function in each term, we have n insertions of the anomalous dimension. We want to have as many insertions of this log as possible. That gives rise to the largest number of logs, okay? But it turns out if you always insert this one, you get zero. <laughs> so in order not to get zero, one needs these cloud effects. And that also shows why there are no superleading logs in E plus E minus. So it turns out we need two cloud insertions, two because otherwise it's imaginary and the rate cannot be imaginary. And we need one insertion of the uh, real emission piece, basically. So we need, basically, this is the color structures one needs to evaluate. In this particular form, you start with the hard function, you have an arbitrary number of collinear emissions, then a Glauber phase, another arbitrary number of collinear emissions, another Glauber phase, and then this real emission. This is the color structures that come with the superleading logs, and R is arbitrary. So it's a, it's a sum here over R. 
Now, this is a very complicated color structure because each time you make an insertion here, the color space goes because each time I add a new part line. So this, you know, if you do this exactly infinite number of, of color indices, someone needs to keep track of. Now, for quark-initiated scattering, so if the initial state particles live in the fundamental representation, then of course, in the fundamental, you know that anti-commutators of color generators can be decomposed into one in the generators themselves. This is simply because these are nine objects and they are a basis of three by three matrices. If you go to the joint representation, this is no longer possible. And then this structure involves symmetrized products of two, three, or even four color generators. So enormously much more complicated. But for the core case, it's simple. And uh, therefore we found that we can write these color structures in this extremely simple form where there's only three structures left that one needs to evaluate. So H4 is the hard function and just take these traces of three color structures to any order in perturbation theory that gives the superleading logs. There are some quantities J here, which are simple angular integrals. They carry the dependence about the rapidity gap. From this formula, we have reproduced everything that is known in the literature on superleading logs. So all the calculations that existed we have basically checked this formula by reproducing everything that is known, but we can do we can do all processes now using this formula. It's completely general. This is what the cross section is. You take this color structure, you multiply with some uh, factorials that come from doing the uh, scale integrals, and you see why the superleading log started for loop because we have three insertions which are not involved with a double log: the two Glauber insertions, the two column phases, basically, and the real emission. So that's why it starts at for loop. And actually, note that the term was n equals zero which doesn't have a superleading log. It nevertheless comes from the same color structures, from the same type of effect, these Coulomb effects. Now, how big are these effects? So we look at quark-quark scattering because that's basically the only thing that was discussed in the literature. Quark-quark scattering can happen in the singlet or the octet channel, of course. And that's what we find. It's hard to read. So center of mass energy, 500 GeV, rapidity gap two, and that's the uh, and that's the sum only over the uh, so n equals not is excluded here so n equals one to n is what summed for n equals one n equals two n equals infinity so the black line is the infinite tower and you see for instance pick q naught of order twenty five gev you see effects of order six percent or so um, just two more slides so these are large effects these are not small effects. Um, let's look why they are large. Uh, it turns out that for the color singlet channel, the formula is extremely simple. One can just do this sum analytically in terms of a hypergeometric function. There is an, a variable here, W, which is NC times alpha over pi times log square. For realistic parameters, this W is about 1.4. In the limit where q over q naught goes to infinity, this w goes to infinity. Okay, but for realistic values, it's a four to one. And there's another w here with a pi, which is the same thing with l replaced by pi. So instead of l square, get pi square. It's also 1.4, turns out, right? Because pi square is a pretty big number. So you see, there's nothing small here. And in fact, in the asymptotic limit, this whole thing actually becomes logarithmically divergent. So this is totally different from Sudakov double logs, which exponentiate into something that falls off extremely fast. Uh, this doesn't fall off at all. Of course, the remaining factors of alpha s fall off as a function of scale, but this thing has the, the slowest possible fall off you could imagine. And since all of these things are order one, you see that it doesn't matter whether it's three loop or four loop or five loop or six loop, uh, the only thing that is small is a single factor of alpha. It has a lot of enhancement and an NC in the denominator. This is why it's uh, subleading in color, but of course it's log enhanced, so it really can be as large as a one loop correction. And of course, this is important for phenomenology. This is the last slide before the conclusions. Uh, phenomenology we have not done yet. We will do, of course, in the future. Um, but there's one very important observation that we made. Um, I have only discussed two to two scattering because this is the only thing that was discussed in the literature, but actually the formula which we derived 
holds for arbitrary two to n. So you just replace h4 by h2 plus n, and then uh, uh, the formula holds. And in particular, it holds if n equals zero or one. And this is something that was not appreciated. So in the literature, people argued that you need at least two final state particles to get this effect. But the point is we have all these collinear emissions. So we generate the final state particles anyway, even if we start with zero. So for instance, quark quark to C plus chat would have super leading logs. Even quark quark to C without chats would have super leading logs. And by the same logic, glue glue to Higgs without a chat will have super leading logs which could be as large as a one loop correction. So this is extremely important, of course, to work this out for gluons and also to see how big the effect is. And if at all the color factors are bigger in the Higgs case than in the quark case, simply by experience with fixed order calculations. So this is my uh, summary. I showed you was the first factorization theorem for a non-global observable at Hadron colliders. This is completely new. It was also the first resumation of superleading logs, extending existing results not by one or two orders, but by infinitely many orders. Um, for now, only for quark-initiated spectrum, um, but in the future also for gluon-initiated spectrum. We have derived the asymptotic behavior of the series, finding a much slower follow than for Sudakov logs. And of course, it's important to go beyond this, in particular, to analyze these low energy matrix elements in more detail to see to what extent this factorization violation will um, manifest itself. Um, but you know, this is, this is difficult, but I think this can be done in this context and this soft collinear effective theory based approach really offers a path toward a complete theory of these non-global um, observables which in turn will have an impact on ongoing attempts to improve pattern showers. Of course, people are constantly working on improving pattern showers. And if these are effects are understood, they can be somehow included there. And as I argued in the end with the Higgs case, obtaining accurate calculations of these effects may be extremely important, even for uh, such a thing as uh, Higgs production in gluon fusion. Thank you. Thank you very much for this spectacular presentation of impressive results. Yes, please use the microphone. I think you have to, we have to wait until the microphone is there. Indeed, uh, thanks for the very interesting talk, Matthias. So, my first question is: Do you expect also for incoming gluons uh, the fall of uh, uh, behavior to yes, not have a fall of behavior uh, like uh, in in the Q over Q zero goes to infinity? What is uh, your oh. uh, e. The answer is definitely yes, but if you ask me, do I know for sure? No. Um, for the quark case, I showed you the simplest case. There are actually three functions. There were these three color structures. So there are three different functions. Uh, the functions are more, they are more complicated with person integrals uh, in the case other than the singlet channel. Um, but that, they have all this, uh, this feature. And I think in the gluon case, the functions will be similar, but not exactly the same. They will be yet more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, the gluon case is not, uh, the gluon case is 90 pages of algebra on my iPad, and they are still being checked by my collaborators. But we think, I mean, in the, in the, instead of three color structures, it will be more like 20 color structures that one finds there. Um, and I cannot tell you what all the functions have in terms of asymptotic behavior, but if I'm not correct, I think it will be possible to also do this in the gluon case with, as I said, much more complicated. It's simply because one gets these symmetrized products of generators, which are nasty in the gluon case, right? And, and so the, the number of structures is much larger, but I think the generic behavior is probably uh, going to be the same. Okay, and uh, do you expect your framework to also be applicable to 
the subleading super log. So, so you mentioned no, 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 no. So, so I, I, I hope I made this clear. The, the original formula that I showed is everything. This thing H times W, I mean, the only thing that's neglected there is power suppressed effects in Q naught over Q. So yeah, at leading power, this is exact. So it will have all subleading logs. I don't think it will be possible to do anything analytically um, with subleading logs. But, but the point is, you can. what you can always do is to, uh, I want to go back to my plot here. So you see that uh, this thing has an alternating sign behavior and it actually, you know, maybe summing the first five terms or so is not going to be a bad approximation, at least not in this case. So one can always expand this exponential to the first n terms and then just evaluate the color traces. And that is, that takes a lot of computing time. Um, but, you know, if we cannot do things analytically, I think we can do them uh, numerically in this way. Nevertheless, the... Uh, Low energy matrix elements are a bit subtle. They're so-called rapidity logs in them, which are single logarithmic. They don't affect the superleading logs, but they will affect the next two superleading logs. Those rapidity logs can be resumed in simple cases. How one would resum them here? I don't know yet. It's to be explored. I mean, there's a lot to be explored beyond the leading log level. Okay, yes, things will get much more complicated. Also. Other physical effects also contribute to them. So, yes, yes. yes. We give a chance to other yes, people. Yes. Final question, Jan. Uh, Matthias, when you discussed this RGEs, you said that the process of low, lower multiplicity mixed with the higher one because of the emission. Don't you think that you should also include recombination processes when the process with higher multiplicity can recombine and then no. lower? No, because uh, these are hard functions. So if you have a hard function with, let's say, four legs, if you want to recombine two, you can never make a massless pattern. So you can never make, you can never take two on shell that's going in, in different directions and make a single on-shell massless particle. So that doesn't work. That simple, simply doesn't work. Thanks, Scott. I mean, that would be, that would be horrible. So the soft function is the opposite. Well, we, yes, I mean, it's in the usual spirit of RG, right? when you lower the, so changing the scale changes the resolution of what you call Massless, so to speak, no? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, for the, for the hard function, it only goes in this direction. What mixes in is the lower multiplicity function for the soft matrix element is the opposite. And that has, you know, that was very difficult to understand when we first found it is that the, uh, let's say the three, the three part on soft function actually requires soft functions of higher multiplicity as counter terms in order for this RG to be consistent. And we checked by explicit calculation that this actually works. This is a very non-trivial RG. It has to be because, you know, it, it is more general than something that could only be described by an integral equation. So this is a very non-trivial physics problem. And, and this is the element where the non-trivial stuff comes in, is this mixing of things with different multiplicities. Also, it's very interesting. Yeah, uh, it's not really well suited for a 25 minute talk. I'm sorry, yeah, that was it. It's a lot this, but this is very recent work that I wanted yeah, to show it here. Looks indeed very impressive. So let's thank Matthias again. Thank you. And I hope for many more conferences before the next wave comes. <laughs> <laughs> and let me let me call the next speaker who is Virgil's uh, Papa. Matthew from Master Algebra Feynman Integrals. One of those? Yes, I think yours was pulled out. Which mics, no? Into the 
να μπω στο Zoom βεβαίω, έτσι δεν είναι. Οπότε να μπούμε στο Zoom. Ωραία. Περισσότερο. Τώρα κάνω σε screen, σωστά. Okay. And everyone hear me, hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's start. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we should give a special thanks to the organizer, not only because they made it into an in-person uh, um, conference for so long, but because it feels completely natural, even though it happens for the first time for all of us, I guess for many, many months, it feels completely safe with all the distances and the, the rules, the reasonable rules we, we observe. So, yes, well done. All right. And uh, here, yes, I'm, um, I'm, it's a pleasure for me to present some recent work uh, that resulted in a PRL article uh, together with Dima Chiche and, and Johannes Hen. And uh, this was also very recently um, awarded uh, the best paper award uh, by our local cluster of excellence in, in Hamburg. So, uh, the main player of uh, my talk will be scattering amplitudes, uh, which are the arena where perturbative quantum field theory confronts experiment. Let me put this. Okay. Uh, as we heard from Matthias, this is not the only uh, uh, ingredient, of course, but it is a very, very important ingredient. And uh, we will also hear in later talks about uh, the precision frontier. We, we shared, in fact, this morning, already in very interesting talks, that we are entering uh, the precision era uh, with respect to LBLHC. Uh, and this uh, uh, improving the higher orders, improving the perturbative expansion going to higher orders is important both for determining standard model parameters, uh, but also perhaps more importantly for being uh, able to tell us new physics from a huge, normally huge standard model background. And uh, I think this is especially relevant. We will hear um, uh, another talk about the high luminosity LHC, I guess, two days from now. Uh, but uh, currently, the only approved uh, major experimental upgrade is the high luminosity LHC. So, no increase in energy, just uh, increase the number of events. So, uh, uh, using precision to be able to spot the events and so on will be one of the main tasks of, uh, of the upcoming years. Uh, so, these are the things uh, that um, excite me in this uh, precision frontier and uh, why I think it's important. Of course, it's very hard and you run out of steam very fast. And uh, before uh, you turn into a version, this talk will not be about n equals for super young mills theory, it will not be about the simplest interacting uh, uh, any, uh, gauge theory, but it will be about how to import, successfully import some of the lessons we learned there uh, to realistic physics. Because uh, uh, in the past, there have been many, many success stories where in this ideal theoretical background, we were able to first uh, do a proof of concept of new methods that were then refined and uh, further developed uh, in order to attack uh, uh, the standard model and beyond. And uh, some examples, are, of course, are generalized unitarity that solved the one new problem forever, for every uh, quantum field theory, and it was first uh, done in the context of n equals 4. More recently, the method of symbols that I will hopefully be able to talk about. 
uh, and uh, define. And uh, very related to this, this is also the method of canonical differential equations, how to recast your master integrals for any process in a, a very uh, nice form that essentially uh, is equivalent to actually evaluating the integrals. Uh, and all these were uh, uh, first uh, understood and formulated in the world of n equals 4. And uh, just to showcase their importance, one of the state-of-the-art uh, computations uh, involving uh, five-point two-loop uh, uh, integrals with one mass, uh, which are, for example, relevant for uh, W boson production plus two jets. Uh, um, yes, these, these would be the jets, the uh, collimated uh, arrays of particles of, uh, yes, from the partons that we also heard about in the previous talk. Uh, and I should also point out that uh, Greece is uh, making major contributions in uh, 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 yes, understanding the, these classes of integrals. The, the group in Democritus have provided fully analytic and very well controlled expressions for these kinds of integrals. But the point here, here is that uh, indeed there is something to learn uh, from importing knowledge from uh, the knowledge transfer from n equals 4. Uh, and with this uh, general motivation, let me talk about cluster algebras. This will be one of the main themes of, of my talk. And uh, these are beautiful mathematical objects that have been tremendously successful in uh, describing singularities of uh, n pop particle amplitudes in n equals 4. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why I, I have been uh, very much focused on understanding and using this, uh, uh, these structures that have, uh, as I will explain, uh, really led to uh, um, uh, results for the six and seven particle amplitude in class four to unprecedented loop order. Uh, and so, uh, from the lessons we have learned in the past, it is very, very natural to pose this question. Could cluster algebras, uh, this beautiful and useful structure in the realm of n equals four, could it have wider applicability? Uh, and uh, in order to search for it, we looked at Feynman integrals because they are theory agnostic, they appear in many different theories. And we looked in dimensional regularization because you always have divergences uh, that only at the very end you can cancel them, and this is the most natural, uh, uh, arguably, way to do it. Uh, and to our great surprise, we found that this kind of cluster algebra structures and code singularity is also in a wealth of physically relevant examples, including QCD corrections to amplitudes that uh, 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 enter uh, the computation of heat plus jet production in uh, hadron colliders. Uh, so we, we I, I am personally very, very excited and look forward to understanding it in the future. But this is, uh, if you wish, the extended abstract of my talk. And now let's try to uh, um, uh, uh, focus, yes, and explain in more detail uh, all these uh, topics. Uh, so, let me define cluster algebras for you, since it's one of the main uh, uh, concepts. Uh, and uh, uh, very roughly, they have some basic ingredients. One of them is some set of variables that are also called cluster A coordinates. This is what they are built of. And these variables, they are grouped into overlapping sets. Overlapping means that the same variable can appear in many different sets. All these have the same size D. Uh, and these are called the clusters, hence the name cluster algebra. And what is remarkable about cluster algebras is that they, you don't know what you will get from the very beginning. It's like chess. You have a certain set of rules that are called mutations, and you play this game, and in the end, you, you, you generate your cluster algebra. Uh, but let me give you an example that will be the main example of my talk, the C2 cluster algebra. This 2 is the run, so it means we have two variables. Uh, and the cluster coordinates uh, are labeled by a single integer, m. Uh, and the initial cluster has size 2, as we said, consists of the first two uh, variables. The remaining classes are a2, a3, a3, a4, and so on. And for this case, this is what it turns out to be the mutation rule. So you get, for example, a3 to be equal to 1 plus a2 over a, a2 squared over a1. And you keep going. So this is what I just told you. You keep playing this game. You uh, uh, use this formula again with this uh, when m is odd. You can replace a3 from the formula you just obtained. 
evidently whatever you will get will be rational functions of your uh, uh, initial cluster variables. Uh, and you keep do doing it and doing it. And very interestingly, after you do it six times, you end up to where you started. So uh, uh, you don't get anything new. Uh, and you can also visualize this, uh, the, the topology of this cluster algebra, which is called an exchange graph, where the nodes are the clusters, A1, A2, A2, A3, A3, A4, and so on. A line is a mutation that uh, relates them, and you have a certain topology because you're back to where you started. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the, the, the particular example of cluster algebra. You might ask, okay, but this is specific. How about more general cluster algebras? And the, the need is really uh, as, uh, this, this mutation, this kind of mutation operation, how you define this more generally. And I will skip the long formulas uh, 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 and just give you one big class uh, uh, which you can geometrize, you can visualize what this mutation is. Uh, when cluster algebras are finite, you uh, can classify them by thinking diagrams. So for the AN case, or as you and uh, uh, algebras, uh, you can think of a cluster as a particular triangulation of an N plus three gon. So the A3 is a hexagon. You here have a hexagon, and you have a non-crossing triangulation. The chords are uh, um, this producing, they splitting it into triangles, they do not cross. And um, the, these chords are themselves the cluster coordinates. And you can figure out that uh, you have different choices uh, of this type. And uh, the mutation in this case is just flipping a diagonal in any rectangle subdiagram. So you perfectly ge geometrically defined. In this example, just pick the middle rectangle and flip this diagonal. So replace it with this diagonal. This is what you obtain. And you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. Uh, and in the end, you generate something which is now three-dimensional because this is a rank three cluster algebra. And you can convince yourself that there are 14 different kinds of triangulations and they are related uh, uh, in this way. And I should say this is an A2 uh, subalgebra of this cluster algebra because you you keep one of the edges fixed. You see all the edges here are fixed. So this is effectively like a pentagon and you obtain this uh, pentagonal uh, subalgebra. Uh, so, uh, but now that I have defined them, let's uh, see how they come about uh, for scattering amplitudes and uh, for quantum field theory. And for this, I need to first of all tell you about this function space of multiple polylogarithms. Uh, this has found numerous applications uh, in, yes, uh, uh, general quantum field theories. And for n equals 4, there is a great deal of evidence that L loop amplitudes are uh, functions of this type with weight k equals twice the loop order. There are general arguments and explicit computations to which I have also contributed. Uh, and probably you may have seen this before, but uh, MPLs are a generalization of logarithms or classical uh, polylogarithms, and they're defined recursively by this differential. Uh, such a function of weight k has a differential of this sort, where the important part here is that you strictly reduce the weight by one. So a logarithm, of course, is part of this class, where this f is weight zero, namely rational functions, the dialogarithm as well. Uh, and um, an important and convenient tool for describing them is the so-called symbol, which essentially encapsulates this definition uh, multiple times. Uh, this is a recursive definition of the symbol where you can compare, I have essentially rewritten the same thing just by replacing the d log with just a tensor product, and then I apply the symbol map again. So I take the differential of fk minus one, and then I uh, I keep adding uh, more tensor, tensor products and uh, let's say different uh, files that are next to each other means that the functions are related by iterated derivatives. I differentiate, I differentiate again, and so on. Uh, uh, so the collection of all these uh, uh, files that are rational, uh, uh, or, or the break functions of your external kinematics is called the symbol alphabet. Uh, 
So now that we have defined uh, our functions, let's see what cluster algebras do for us. Cluster algebras provide the right variables to describe these functions. Uh, and now that we have defined them, let's say instead of right variables, I should say, tell us for us what the symbol alphabet of these functions are in this very general class. Uh, and as was uh, strongly motivated by the Brown group, uh, it turns out that precisely these letters, the symbol alphabet, uh, uh, for uh, 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 yes, uh, amplitudes in n equals four, uh, are given by GR4, n cluster algebras. Uh, you don't need to know exactly what these are, but you already know, in fact, one of these examples. This is the A3 example I showed you. So you're already familiar with one example. And the other one is the E6, which is also fine. Uh, but uh, physically, it's easy to see from the previous definition, the, from this D log, that when the phi is going to zero infinity, this tells you potential singularities uh, of uh, your amplitude. So this is what their physical significance is. And uh, just to showcase their importance, uh, I will not uh, mention the long list of papers I had in the second paper, but uh, there is a very nice, I believe, review uh, of, uh, of this field uh, based on a talk I had given here two years ago. Uh, uh, you can actually uh, uh, use this information, it's a cr crucial ingredient for computing the actual amplitudes uh, via the amplitude bootstrap method. Uh, and uh, the gist of the method is that you first uh, construct all possible amplitudes, let's say the space of candidate amplitudes, this is what this blob, like a Venn diagram means, and then you pin down, you identify the single uh, 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 part of the set, which is the amplitude itself. And uh, uh, through the work that I have led in the past year, uh, uh, the six particle amplitude is known to seven loops and the seven particle amplitude to four loops. So much, much higher than the two or three loop uh, um, uh, uh, progress that um, uh, has been achieved for, uh, for realistic gauge theories. Uh, so this is uh, perhaps why one could, set, one could harness this, this power. Uh, there's one more technical thing that I would like to tell you uh, uh, before I, I end this introduction, and is that so far I have only talked about cluster variables, not about the cluster themselves. Do they play a role in amplitude, the actual clusters, how these variables are grouped into each other? And it turns out that they do. Uh, they can only appear next to each other in the symbols, two of the, the, such cluster variables, if there exists a cluster when uh, we're containing both. And in this particular, in this example of A3, I told you that cluster variable clusters themselves consist of non-crossing diagonals. Therefore, you will never find a cluster where diagonals cross. So the, the variables that uh, uh, correspond to these crossing diagonals can never appear next to each other in the symbol. Uh, we have a physical understanding uh, uh, through the work of, uh, yes, my collaborators and myself about this uh, particular, uh, 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 yes, absence of, uh, 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 of forbidden letters, uh, because it rel it's related with time and relations, and it turns out that it implies the rest. But very importantly, it massively reduces the size of candidate alpha uh, uh, amplitudes, and that's why it gives it gives you so much power. Uh, if this was very technical, let me summarize the uh, the um, introduction or the the, the review of uh, the n equals four world by an analogy uh, 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 that I would dare to draw between the symbol of the amplitude the n equals four and the DNA. Uh, the DNA, of course, is a double helix, as we all know, but for the sake of the argument, we can unwind it. We can follow a zigzag path around it and then turn it linear. Uh, and of course, the, the symbol is also a, a, a tensor product of different spaces, of different letters. So evidently, cluster variables play for the symbol, they're all the basis uh, play for the DNA. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps, uh, yes, equally importantly, since this comes from a helix, we know that adenine only goes with thymine. You cannot combine it with the other bases. And similarly, uh, adjacency has to do with the, the, the pairs of letters. Uh, so the, the question we try to answer is, 
could cluster algebra small colloquially provide some sort of genetic material, not just for n equals four, but for uh, generic quantum field theories? And this is what I will focus on uh, uh, in the main part of my talk. Where do we look? Uh, what we did was to look at scalar Feynman integrals with masses for pagators in dim ring. And as I said, integrals are theory agnostic, they appear in different theories, that's why. There is no uh, loss of generality when considering uh, scalar integrals, you can reduce tensor integrals. Uh, uh, the dimension is 4 minus epsilon because we take epsilon to the zero only at the very end. And the only real assumption was these massless propagators that is a very natural thing to do if you come from the n equals four world and it's a simple, uh, um, uh, it's a simple starting point. Uh, I just flash one loop and uh, one loop example just uh, for my notations. A double uh, uh, box means a massive leg in this instance. Uh, the dimension is here. Uh, and just to remind you that uh, for any given set of integrals, let's say those that contribute to a process, there are relations, integration by parts identities. So basis in this vector space is the so-called master integrals. Uh, and the main example that uh, for different reasons we focused on is this uh, four point functions with one of shell length. Uh, uh, four particles because we would like to have scattering, not just decays, and uh, one massive leg because uh, uh, we we'll see. But uh, in any case, uh, from the kinematics, it's uh, easy to realize that uh, you, in fact, have just two independent variables. These are massless uh, legs, so only the cross products uh, are meaningful. Due to momentum conservation, they satisfy this constraint. Uh, so you have two, uh, um, two independent variables. And long time ago, German and Remedy analyzed what the alphabet is. And as we see in this example, there are six letters that are linear functions of the kinematics. They're called 2 DHPLs. Uh, and also, yes, uh, the, these are the, the, the master integral studying. More recently, there is also a three loop family that was studied, both planar and non planar, you see. Uh, and so, having focused on this example, comes the question how do you identify, do you identify the cluster algebra? How do you associate one with? Uh, um, uh, with a particular uh, process. And uh, there are some necessary conditions, like the number of variables. We saw that it's two for two DHPLs. And for example, there are also two in the A2 example. Uh, however, if you go and you count the number of letters, you see a mismatch. And this was for a long time one of the stumbling uh, blocks of why people from, let's say, the N equal four world have been thought of. Uh, applying this technology to, to the real world. Uh, in the N equals 4 world, we only have simply laced groups, A, B, or E. Uh, and it was this discussion that we were having in Edinburgh right before the lockdown in a very interesting workshop with Johannes Hen, when he pointed out to me this mismatch. Uh, we were lucky to be in the same uh, uh, bed and breakfast, and I thought about it, and I told him, you know what, there's another cluster algebra, C2. We saw it, it's the hexagon we saw in the second or third slide, but has, uh, yes, six clusters and six variables, and the numbers match. And then we went on and looked at uh, weight two uh, combinations, uh, yeah, weight two symbols, and the numbers matched as well. Weight three, and we can keep going. So uh, this gave us great certainty that whatever we were, uh, was known in the Fino literature, must have been related to the types of cluster variables I also presented you early on in the slides. And the question was how to relate the two. Uh, I will not go into the detail, but it's a very simple transformation and there's a systematic way to get it. Uh, once you are uh, pretty sure that the alphabets are uh, related, they're equivalent. And so the, the, uh, the conclusion is that these very long class of functions are in fact polylogarithms uh, related to the C2 cluster algebra. Okay, but what is the physical significance of this class of functions? So the master integrals that uh, are expressed in, in terms of 2DHPLs, uh, they appear in many physical contexts, important physical contexts. They were initially uh, uh, used for uh, deep in elastic scattering, uh, but if, uh, uh, yes, uh, leptonic uh, uh, scattering is not your thing, uh, they also appear, let's say, in hadronic uh, uh, Z-boson production. 
Uh, and perhaps more importantly, because the Higgs is ma made one of the stars of the last uh, 10 years or so, they also appear in uh, uh, Higgs plus jet uh, production in, uh, in Hadron Colliders. Uh, that is in the heavy top mass limit where one integrates out this, uh, this Fermion loop. And this is very, very reasonable and it appears as a uh, desired experimental approximation, say, in, in, in the Lesus uh, wish list. So, uh, uh, I think, uh, yes, for us it was very exciting that this uh, mathematical object underlies Higgs amplitude. Uh, of course, having found it, uh, there is a natural question, what does it buy you? Uh, and uh, uh, for sure, it points to you uh, this kind of adjacency properties. What kind of letters can appear next to each other in the symbol? For this, it's easier to use the canonical differential equations approach. Now, as I'm running out of time, I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, but uh, the essence of having a basis is that you differentiate your back into the basis. And uh, in the clever... Uh, uh, um, change of basis that uh, Johannes uh, recommended, you have an explicit epsilon when you differentiate, uh, and uh, this makes your life easier. You have some constant matrices, and then uh, whatever is, yes, the letters of uh, your uh, multiple polylogarithms that your uh, master integrals evaluate to, and then any kind of adjacency property uh, can be translated into a statement about these matrices, to all orders in epsilon. So that's the benefit that you gain. And uh, so these kinds of relations are very important, say, when you try to analytically continue your function. You start from the Euclidean region, you want to go to some physical region. This uh, uh, means that you will not have certain iterated discontinuities and it will make your life easier. Uh, so what did we see? What did we uh, find for this particular class of functions? Um, the, the cluster algebra revealed for us that there are indeed this type of adjacency relations where A1 can never appear uh, 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 next to A, uh, A3, A3 not, not, not next to A5 and so on. Uh, and you see indeed that A1 never appears together with A3 in a cluster. So this is consistent with the notion of cluster adjacency. And this was something that was not observed. These uh, integrals and these functions were known for a long time. No one had observed this. Uh, so we did learn something new about them. And just to highlight their importance, uh, uh, assume that you were looking at the, the, the space of functions containing these integrals to form loops or weight eight without this property and with this property. You see that this space is less than half when you are also uh, demand that uh, this kind of adjacency condition uh, is, uh, appears. And so you, you, you have very fewer choices to, to look for, uh, for, for, let's say, your physical quantity. And this has already been applied in uh, parallel work by Dixon collaborators in bootstrapping an analog of the Higgs amplitude in N equals four world. Uh, so with this, I, I will go to my conclusions because I'm out of time. Uh, there are several more examples and that you are welcome to ask if you are interested, including how to go from the eight particle amplitude in N equals four to five uh, gluon uh, scattering in QCD. Uh, so I invite you to ask. Uh, but I hope I can visit that the beautiful mathematics of cluster algebras seems to underlie a wealth of uh, physically relevant Feynman integrals and processes. Uh, uh, there are interesting two things to do in the, in, the, in the future to see if this is more universal or just the uh, But if you wish as a vision and something that is very much like to understand is whether cluster algebras could provide uh, a kind of uh, uh, organizing principle as you go with genetic materials that would simplify future collider physics calculations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Yes, questions? Yes, go ahead. You mentioned linking diagrams that are uh, used for the algebra. Can you better explain the connection from between cluster algebra and linking diagrams? Uh, this uh, I could be talking for another hour about this, but uh, uh, one 
one way the connection appears is uh, uh, because you can represent so i gave you the geometric representation of uh, some of the simplest uh, like class of cluster algebras more generally you can uh, encode the information of every cluster of its variables and how you can reach other clusters by mutations by quivers uh, oriented graphs and uh, it is a theorem that whenever your quiver looks like a blinking uh, diagram uh, then this uh, uh, um, is uh, related to the the, the Lie algebra of, of the, the associated Lie algebra. So this is uh, one way that one can uh, uh, establish a connection with Lie algebras. But I should say that uh, cluster algebras, uh, as you saw from the example, they are commutative algebras. So you really multiply these factors together. There is nothing non-commutative there. Uh, the, uh, the the relation with the algebras has to do with the uh, the, the, the quivers encoding them, and uh, ultimately to uh, as we saw this kind of topology and geometry uh, of, uh, of of the cluster algebra. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very exciting talk and. I wanted to come back to this last point that you're making here in the box. So trying to understand what you have in mind there. I mean, are the, are the cluster algebras more general or the Feynman graphs? I mean, does, does every Feynman set of Feynman integrals have a cluster algebra or, or, or vice versa? Uh, we don't know uh, because we are just barely, uh, like barely scratching, uh, yes, the surface. We, are, uh, we just discovered the tip of the iceberg. I should say, it's almost entirely clear that class algebras are not the end of the story. And uh, this is what uh, I uh, have here in this slide. At least in the n equals 4 world, the rele relevant class algebras, when you go to eight points and higher, I talked about six and seven points, become infinite. So this gives you the, it's a big puzzle because if you have infinite choices, then we lose all predictability. Uh, and in this work with my student uh, two years ago, but that was uh, simultaneously with work also from uh, uh, US group uh, centered at Princeton and another group uh, in Southampton, we resolved this issue. We, we found an appropriate generalization that is finite. Uh, and uh, uh, also, at the same time, I haven't, haven't included it here, we, we generalize the functions because uh, if you noticed from that simple example I, I, I mentioned, uh, all the letters uh, in class are always rational functions of your variables. Of course, we know that there exist the square root, uh, square roots, let's say, uh, letters, yes, that contain square roots in terms of the kinematics. We also contain, we also obtain square roots in this fashion. Uh, so, uh, I would say that uh, at least for the class of integrals that uh, uh, are expressed in terms of multiple polylogarithms, there should be some generalization of cluster algebras at play. And it would be very interesting to uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, first uh, study many examples to convince ourselves what the pattern is and then prove it by first principles, perhaps by the Landau equation uh, analysis. It's a different mathematical way to think about. I would think so. Yet again, no? We could thank the speaker for a beautiful talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And let me call the next speaker, uh, who is Alexander Kusina. Is he joining us remotely or remotely on strange content of proton and nuclei. Oh, should give this to the next speaker.
So I invite I invite next speaker to share. One hour, one hour time difference. <laughs> so if we, uh, yeah, we go to the next one. So the next speaker is is speaking uh, advance on uh, gauge dependence on spin amplitudes. In fact, the title doesn't say that it's on gauge dependence, but that's what I guess. You have some, you have a, a, a wire connection, right? Mm. Yes. Okay, so you can go and do. So maybe I will start talking without uh, slides. So my specialty of work was for the last year's Monte Carlo programs. Uh, that means spin amplitudes were just things I was using as an input, but then I had to adopt this input to my uh, purposes. And as a consequence of it, uh, I was looking at spin amplitudes from some uh, perspective. So I was expecting to, to do this fixing while previous talk was going on. So I apologize for some uh, mess. I think I will need your help because I'm not very fluent and usually I have some... Uh, okay. 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 No. Uh, yeah. video. I should press here. What do you do? You share yeah. screen. Share the screen. Also, I have to. No, no, no. Okay. And, and now I have to. No, you are sorry, you Okay. Ah, yeah. You can go for free. Okay. Okay. Does it work? Very good. Yeah, so, I would like to say about something about symmetries of spin amplitudes. I had to use it uh, in my uh, in my work, uh, so uh, I got some experience from phenology point of view. When you want to prepare Monte Carlo simulation of other calculations for accelerator uh, experiments, you need to use, of course, uh, fixed order calculations. You need to use uh, resumations. Sometimes you need to use results from dispersion relations, which is a pain because they are anti-analytic. So 
uh, you need to combine a lot of things from the point of view of detectors, higher orders, uh, and things like that. So there is always a question how to combine these different aspects of work. Uh, how in project uh, I participated, uh, I would like to say something, how symmetry was there used. Unfortunately, never was a uh, central part of activity, but maybe at the end uh, it's worth to say a few words about because I've, it provided some solutions to some challenges. So now, ah, yeah, I have to point here, of course. No, it used to work a moment ago, and now it doesn't. Oh, it worked. Okay, so uh, I will work with examples, in my working examples. So first I will talk about QED Bremsstrahlung amplitudes for S-channel process. It's different if it's for all processes, so the main process was to be S-channel. Then I will talk about extension in cases when nevertheless some T-channel contribution is added but does not provide a structure of singularities. I will say a few words about spin amplitudes for Bremsstrahlung in tau case because then there is a comparison of results from QED and scalar QED. For continuation, I will jump to some byproduct of calculations, which is spin amplitudes for double Bremsstrahlung in QCD, and then a few words about approximation. One of the big words of symmetry in practice, I was uh, fighting to get some orders in terms. So I used independence from the changes of gauge, uh, in fact, of Colina part of the gauge, because the other part of gauge group were not so important. So that's the question of uh, replacing the photon polarization with part which includes uh, collinear uh, momentum, uh, which could make no changes. So uh, there are big difficulties and ben benefits when one automatic calculations use. One of the benefits is of course that you get results. Uh, disadvantages is because you get uh, travels with tricks like this ones. That's extra layer of activity of travel. Oh. So I will not talk about general factorization, like factorization of tau production and decay. It should be other talk. I will also not talk about uh, separation of big picture. That means when you want to have standard model precision uh, results, you want to divide it into part, which is something like improved born, something about initial final state effects, maybe some interferences. That's also a huge subject which uh, should be covered elsewhere. I will talk about trivial thing, seemingly trivial thing, but useful. When you have the amplitude, the full amplitude, uh, like M, uh, you want to separate it into product of the two plus correction. You would like to have the product to have some nice uh, structure for iteration, uh, for estimation, but nevertheless have this
and the other part is not. Uh, it will change with uh, photon polarization, uh, with uh, photon polarization getting longitudinal path. So now everybody can hear me or? Okay. So uh, if you work on the other part, we get part of the uh, iconal factor multiplying Born amplitude. And if we combine two such parts uh, together, we get iconal part, which is uh, gauge uh, invariant. And the same iterates if we have many more photons. And because it's QED, because it's Ian Frausch's Sura scheme, these results are coming out and are immediately useful. And you have all guarantees that it makes sense to go like that. So this is pure pedagogical part and it corresponds to this, what was done uh, many, many years ago. So the amplitude for double Bremsstrahlung can be divided into part which is Born amplitude times iconal factors plus terms corresponding to beta one function for first and second photon and part of amplitude beta two, which is of uh, double photon emission. Important thing is that all singularities, collinear and uh, soft, are hidden in the uh, iconal factors and beta one, beta two functions, and of course, Born are all uh, finite and they do not explode within phase space. And that's important to have this kind of ordering of terms for construction of Monte Carlos. Also, what is very important that up to the details of definition of MB and beta one and B22, this scheme can be used all over the phase space. So you do not need to worry about what happens at the edges of phase space. Uh, you can make the full coverage and everywhere you have the uh, you have the matrix element and it's valid also because of uh, of the scheme to all orders so you have improvement of uh, of convergence so uh, i used some notations and signs from the work we which took us several years to construct monte carlos for left, one of the possibilities to construct of this was that part of the multiphoton, uh, both phase space and matrix element, has extra symmetry, which is conformal symmetry, symmetry of scale, and that helps to organize the predictions. You could make approximate one without phase space Jacobians lambda one half functions, and then you could add it uh, by after rescaling uh, the later um, part of generation. So the second extension of it was what happens if one plays with uh, final states of two neutrinos and two neutrinos can be electrons. Then of course appear the problem that you have to take into account emission from W. Your amplitudes are not anymore specifically separating into part for initial state emissions and final state, final state is absent, except this intermediate state emission of W. So uh, to go with this, you have to make comparisons of two uh, kind of the theoretical scheme. One is iconal QE and another one is uh, iconal QED with contact interaction. And only after that, you can use the old, old scheme you used in the previous uh, case. And you can add the contribution from uh, W uh, emission dependence on T uh, transfer uh, perturbatively uh, through the beta one function. And this goes also with the case of double photon amplitudes. What happens there and is extra complication is that you are any more sitting within a really QED scheme. You even have to take into account with the diagram on the right hand side where the photon is connected to W and uh, non-physical high fix field of standard model, which is remnant of the charged Higgs. So uh, you get amplitudes, uh, but it's very difficult to say if you are still sitting within uh, QED or whether you are already going deep into the standard model extension. And the question is whether such scheme will not break 
the rules and this has to be gone case by case. So that was the work uh, I did for many years with uh, Dima Bardin and also myself just to systematize this uh, spin amplitude uh, structure. So QED, scalar QED case. So amplitude for scalar QED is very simple. It's formula number five. Uh, but if you want to get iconal factor out of it, it starts to be complicated uh, because it's not natural to get it. And the correction beyond uh, iconal part is uh, not uh, trivial. It's formula number seven. Or you can get a different uh, approach, which are formula number eight and nine. It depends on how close you want to get uh, for the first part to be iconal factor multiplying born and what this born uh, may, me may mean. It's not uh, trivial and depending on it, you can get different structures. So uh, things, if you go into picture of amplitude squared, you get something which is a little bit uh, simpler. You have combination of born like terms except that fundamenta are uh, combined. So uh, T differs from T prime, but this is how the uh, form momentum of photon is used. So uh, spin amplitudes for double Bremsstrahlung in QCD. Surprisingly, it's simpler case than scalar QD. Uh, and uh, you can get separation first because of QCD operators, of SU, SU3 group uh, operators, and then the bulk of the structure game is going out with the uh, structure of Lorentz group. So you can easily separate this amplitude into parts, and as in previous cases, I was not saying it before, the separation is driven by uh, independence on photon, on collinear uh, gluon polarization and on the structure of singularities. Structure of singularities is uh, related to the boost of uh, uh, Lorentz group. So you can divide the spin amplitude into gauge invariant parts. I will not talk too much about details of this uh, separation but if you look at it you will surprisingly find that by combining these terms in different things you can get uh, terms which corresponds to uh, schemes like bfkl dglab or ccfm i will not talk about it but somehow from the just pure play of uh, symmetry of the amplitude of finding gauge invariant parts and following the structure of this that you first group as little as possible to get iconal factor or a uh, factor corresponding to collinear and soft emission like formula 12 you get uh, uh, symptoms of something which correspond, which later on gives uh, uh, factorization schemes. What was surprised to me is when I was studying this amplitude, I found the amplitudes for QCD much closer in nature to those of QED than those of scalar QED. I would think that scalar QED should be closer to QED from geometrical point of view, but it was not. It is uh, maybe because it's not renormalizable theory. So that was the work I did uh, at that time. And uh, then uh, we tried to apply the same scheme for the case emission of emission of pair of termins. That was for precision simulation, both for LEP and for Bell. You need to have much closer, much better precision of final states. So the question of pair emission appear. And the question is how to calculate the systematic error of it. You cannot apply for the algorithm all these diagrams uh, and have something which is universal, which can be applied to any 
process, even though the calculations for four fermion final state exist, you need to combine this with multiple photon emissions and also you need to have it for all processes. So you want to find something which is universal and precise enough. Unfortunately, from a theoretical point of view, the iconal factor for such thing is enough. So that somehow slow down uh, the work. Uh, but you may ask how to play and whether you can get uh, something better than that just for the sake of play. And here, what you find uh, is uh, that if you look at such process, you can have a lot of regimes because you may think that par L plus L plus L minus is your main process and F F bar is correction or the opposite way around. You may also think of it as part of the contribution where you have evolution of parton which goes from L to F and then back to photon or gluon and L. So you have a lot of options. That means gauge separation into part is not providing something which is very useful. There are simply too many scenarios and you cannot uh, go with them easily. So we tried to play with some options using simplifications. Uh, so just to use some gauge invariance separation of the amplitudes and then uh, trying to get something inspired by it. And this gave uh, some tool which could be used for studies of systematic error. It reduced uh, differences with respect to uh, exact calculations of such amplitude uh, by about factor of four. But at the same time, it is more suitable for iteration for combining with uh, multiple photon emissions. So it's from the point of view of writing Monte Carlo, which has to give uh, predictions, uh, it's important to have. Maybe not now, but in the future. So, so in all these games, symmetries help separation of spin amplitudes into part. Uh, this was important because we had to deal for the Monte Carlos with fully differential and valid all over the phase space predictions, including some uh, endpoint uh, corners, because that's important for simulations of background. So it cannot for some new physics processes. So experiments wanted to have. This is also very important for multidimensional distributions, which are becoming fashionable these days uh, because of machine learning techniques. So one has to have a control of this. Uh, we had we exposed part of QCD predictions, which uh, look like QED or iconal QED, but not always are this. So sometimes for this QED part, the contributions from the charge Higgs had to be taken into account. Um, this is also important because if you need to have predictions of the fixed order combined with higher orders, having separation of this, which needs to be taken at higher orders is important. This helps to avoid calculation and inclusion of uh, enormous amount of uh, negligible terms. Uh, in my talk, I talk a little about loop corrections, which are equally important, partly because from the point of view of Monte Carlo construction, it was less of a pain because they do not bring more complicated uh, phase space. And from Monte Carlo, phase space is important. Uh, I was also not talking about similarities of amplitudes for different processes. So when you looked at it carefully, but then you forget in a few minutes, uh, you find out like if there was somewhere a sign of supersymmetry or other algebra, algebraic symmetries which combine the functions uh, because of some hidden re re reasons. So this advantage of these techniques is that you cannot rely so easily on algebraic methods if you have Kleist Stirling uh, spinner techniques or other te techniques of that sort, uh, this kind of separation of the part of the part is uh, hidden uh, because it's uh, 
uh, hidden by the fact that you use some auxiliary uh, momentum for defining spin states uh, and for defining spinners in, in the technique. Uh, anyway, at lab separation into this kind of the part was indispensable. It's used at LHC2. I don't know how this kind of the techniques uh, will be in the future, uh, but I would think it's worth to keeping this in the toolbox and in, not in the toolbox. Just be aware that one day you may need to have them. Uh, so do not drop the topic out completely. And uh, even if use of it brings a lot of pain, which I remember, uh, it brings also sometimes much rare, but sometimes some fun also, and you may have a feeling that you are touching something uh, of general structure of field theory during the common work when you really want to get predictions for, uh, for experiments with some precision which is given in per mils or Percents, but in hard numbers, uh, absolute numbers. So that's about all what I thought I might talk here about. I hope it will be useful to somebody. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Or perhaps comments? I don't see any. So if not, then, then we thank the speaker again. And I suggest we try to call the previous speaker who didn't show up. So I'm not sure if he has a chance to hear my voice, but I'm calling uh, Dr. Alexander Kuzina who is supposed to talk about strange content of proton and nuclei. He's not responding, so... So I'm afraid, I'm afraid we... Thank all the speakers and close the session. Thank you.